You're the person interviewing me? Yes, I'm okay, the HR so... lady who's interviewing you for that particular position. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm nervous. I won't <laughs> lie, I'm a little nervous now. <laughs> I believe you, but that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's fine, that's normal. <laughs> It's the Germany Experience, the podcast about life in Germany as seen through the eyes of outsiders. I'm your host, Sean, and welcome to this episode. You can visit thegermanyexperience.de to get more information about the show, or you can email me directly at info at thegermanyexperience.de. This episode, Lisa Jans of Job Coach Germany is joining me to go through the details of a job interview in Germany. So you can hear about what the phases of an interview are, what's expected of you, and what you can expect. But before we get to that, it is that time of the year again. The first advent is happening this Sunday, the 28th of November. And of course, what that means is that it's time for the annual podcaster advent face-off that Nicole of the Expat Cast and I do. We've done it two years where we try to see who can raise the most money for a charity. Why do we do this? Because as foreigners here, Germany has given us so much. And so it's good to give back. And then we take this chance every year to try and give back a little something to Germany. Last year, the Germany experience won because of my fabulous listeners. And I'm hoping that we can pull it off again this year. This year, it's called Thregi Padvo. Now you would, uh, this is something that stuck since the first year, which was called, by the way, Feggy Padvo, which stood for the first ever German expat podcasters advent donations face off. <laughs> and that was named by Nicole. It's not snappy. It does not roll off the tongue, but there you go. That was called Feggy Padvo. The second one was called Seggy Padvo. And this one we could have called Teggy Padvo, but we kind of like the sound of Thregi Padvo. So that is the third ever Germany expat podcasters Advents donation face-off or something like that. The charity that we're supporting this year is called Kinderlachen. It's a name that translates to children's laughter. And they have a lot of different projects that focus on helping children in Germany. The specific project I'm supporting is called Bewegende Kinderschicksal or Changing Children's Destiny. And what this is, is helping children who are in unexpected situations. Now, often families are torn from their everyday lives by a simple stroke of fate, either a serious illness or an accident or personal circumstances. And some families have to cope with this new situation alone. This can cause psychological as well as financial problems, which the families sometimes cannot cope with on their own. And this is where Kinderlachen comes in, specifically with this project, Bewegende Kinderschicksal. They go in on a needs-oriented basis and they decide based on the case what is needed and they focus on uncomplicated and quick assistance. Some examples that they give is uh, Kinderlachen facilitates care, therapies, and also operations or inpatient stays when the families can no longer afford it financially. So that's the project that I'm supporting. Nicole is going to choose her own project to support. She will tell you about that on her show, The Expat Cast. So go and subscribe to her podcast if you don't already. And we will, of course, be competing to see who raises the most for their chosen project. To donate on behalf of The Germany Experience, go to thegermanyexperience.de forward slash charity. The link is also in the show notes. There you'll find a link to go and donate. The donation form itself is unfortunately only available in German, but on that page, the germanyexperience.de forward slash charity, I have also posted a translation of the different fields of the uh, donation form so that you can use that as a reference. Go and get donating and help me beat Nicole and the expat cast again this year. Now onto our guest this week. It's Lisa Jans of Job Coach Germany, as I said earlier. And she is focused on helping people find their dream career in Germany. She has an HR background, so she knows the process in Germany from the inside, basically. She's been on the podcast before uh, talking about how to figure out what kind of job you want. And I've linked to that episode in the show notes as well. Uh, now, this time she's back to take us step by step through a typical job interview in Germany. Uh, during the process, she also asks me some standard questions and then critiques me on my answers to help us understand what interviewers are looking for, what kind of questions they're going to ask. So if you're going to be having job interviews, whether it's your first one or whether you're looking to change jobs in the future, Lisa's got a lot of advice that she gives to help you better prepare yourself. 
Also, if you want to get in touch with Lisa, go to lisajans.com. That's Lisa, L-I-S-A, Jans, J-A-N-Z.com. The link also in the show notes. Here she is. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the anatomy of a German job interview. So what actually happens You've got, you've got the interview, you go to the interview, and then you're sitting in the room. What happens in that interview and what the people can expect? Because I think, especially for first-time foreigners, you might not have any idea what to expect. So at least this will give you a feel. It's always going to be a bit different in reality, but this will give you a, a, an idea of the basics that you can ex- ex- expect. But before we get started, Lisa, maybe introduce yourself and what it is that you do. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Lisa Jans, and I'm also known as Job Coach Germany. And in my position as being a job coach, I support international professionals landing their ideal job here in Germany. So I follow and support my coaches from the very beginning, which basically means defining the ideal career profile, then doing the job search, preparing the application documents, the CV and the cover letter. And then also, and that's my specialty, doing mock job interviews. So basically testing the interview before the actual interview of the coachee, which actually helps them a lot with, yeah, feeling more confident when it comes to the actual interview. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they've already gotten asked the questions that they're probably going to get asked and they will have uh, considered something. So yeah, I think that that's very important to just calming the nerves a bit because it can be pretty nerve wracking going for an, for, for an interview in, in a new country. It's, or, that's um, so true. Sure. And you would not believe it. I mean, there are so many different coaches that I have. So some of them are um, at the end of 20. Some of them are in their mid 50s. And they're always right. so excited and nervous before the job yeah. interview. So this really helps. Let's let's get into it. So the, we, we've we've gotten to the point where we, we uh, had some contact with a company, a German company, and the company has invited uh, some someone to an interview, and that means you go to the building, and then what what can people expect uh, right from the very beginning or at the very beginning of a, of an interview process? Yeah, so it already starts on your way to the company, basically, and um, normally I try to hype up uh, everybody that I'm working with by telling them, okay, just take a look in the mirror and say, you got this, you can do this, (laughs) that's going to be okay. And then normally somebody picks you up from the entrance uh, of the company. Maybe you are on a very huge factory plant. So somebody is going to tell you how you get to that particular room where the interview takes place. And when you reach that room, you normally either somebody opens the door or you can also knock on the door if uh, you ha- you're right at the time for your appointment. Uh, sometimes this is already the first hurdle. Uh, if the door is closed, they want yeah. to um, just find out whether you are so uh, taking the initiative and actually knock on the door. And then you basically, the door is open and you take one step into the room. So there's some psychology behind that. And um, you take a first step into the room and then you wait. What happens? What is the interviewer doing? Are they reaching out their hand to you? Then you can reach out your hand as well to shake the hands. But now Mm -hmm. uh, shaking hands is not so typical anymore. So you just wait and probably there is no handshake, but they will probably assign you a seat. And if they don't and they just tell you, here's the room, pick a seat. I would always highly recommend for you to take a seat where you can see the door either on your side or um, behind the interviewer. But make sure that the door is not behind you because you are already very nervous. And if something is happening behind you, behind you is the door, then you get even more nervous and you don't need that. That's a, that's a great bit of advice. I thought you were going to say that it's a good idea in case you need to run. Exactly. <laughs> Get out of there exactly. as fast as possible. Yeah. Uh, before you before you continue, I just have a question about that. So so that that's the case when you have a physical job interview going to the thing. Right now in corona times especially um and with with companies moving more to remote work uh, slowly but surely uh, a, a lot of this will just be digital then. So this, obviously, this going into the room and so on, this 
uh, won't happen. It's just a matter no. of making sure that all of the technical side um, is working. So you, right. there are so many different platforms and softwares that companies are using to invite you to this job interview. So try to test that beforehand with a friend that you know mm -hmm. that it's working. Sometimes it's not possible to test it with a friend. Then you just need to make sure, is your microphone working? Can this website, yeah. the, the, the browser access your microphone and your camera and so on? And then... Right. Everything that happens, whether that's physical or virtual, there will be a small talk. So people will start by introducing how do you feel today and did you get into the room, virtual or physical, well, did you get to our company well, um, yeah. is everything working? And then they would also try to ask a question that makes the interviewee feel comfortable. So that could okay. be, but it's a very light question. So something that you don't have to worry about, that's... In mm -hmm. the physical world, more about how you got there, like your travel, was that fine or not? And in, in the virtual world, it would just simply be about um, how is the weather like at your end, where you are right now? In the physical interview, we would normally ask, we as recruiters would normally ask uh, whether you want to have uh, water or coffee or some juice or so. And in these very first moments of the small talk, it's very important that you don't say no. Okay, so even if you don't <laughs> want to have a coffee, you tell them, thank you very much, but I would rather prefer a water. Or you say, thank you very much, but I already had some drink, so I'm fine now. So this is something, so you kind of like... Okay. Go around that question so that you don't have to say no. What, uh, what's some, the reason? The, there is this psychology behind that. It's um, what we know from the negotiation process. So when you mm -hmm. go into a negotiation, you want to make sure that the first couple of words that you're, that the person that you want to convince are yes, yes, yes. So you're looking okay. for three yeses and then you know there is going to be a contract. And that's, you just want to make sure that um the, that this base is set and that you right. have the great uh, positive impression okay so avoiding all kinds of negativity or or, or anything helps with the psychological viewpoint that the, the the interviewers would have of you okay that's interesting i didn't think about that yeah and then in the virtual world obviously they they won't ask you for water they will just ask you whether you have everything that you need whether you still mm. uh, need to get a glass of water then they would give you that time as well um, just in case you forgot about that. That's basically right. what they do for the small talk part. And basically from there, you slide right into the, the next part of the job interview, which is the part where the interviewees are introducing themselves. That's mm -hmm. physical or virtual. It's the same. And it's very brief. It's very short. But it gives the applicant or the candidate the the chance to to settle into the situation and that's why they give their in, intro, introduction first so it's basically like two three minutes when they are talking about themselves and the candidate can just think okay they're talking about themselves that's fine and I, i'm off. here now everything is fine i can i can yeah. try to relax However, right. you still need to <laughs> comprehend what they are saying <laughs> in case you have yeah. any questions later on. Yeah. And and who who is usually in the interview at, at that point? Because it's usually it's I guess it's usually going to be the 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 line manager or the hiring manager, direct manager and then maybe an HR person? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. And tr that's true. So you normally have an HR person and the line manager, so the the person that you will be directly uh, sub, uh, reporting to this person will mm -hmm. be there and this is also very good for you that this person is there because you can find out okay who is like how is this person as a boss is he comfortable to talk to or not and um yeah and then the hr person will always ask the hr questions that are more psychological at point and the okay. line manager will ask technical questions and then okay. If the company is very big, then it's normal that there is a third person from the work council at the interview as well, trying to make sure mm -hmm. that everything goes to plan, that the, that the person that is being interviewed is um, safe and so on. So that's why the work council is there as well. Okay, so they so they're doing their their uh, introductions. You can also use that to kind of figure out who who you're talking to, what kind of level of senior seniority they have, 
and so on. So, so with the introductions done, what's the next step? That's the most important part that will probably already give a hint how the rest of the interview will go. And that's okay. the applicant's pitch. So we can always think about it. Either you do an elevator pitch and an elevator pitch mm -hmm. is normally not longer than 60 to 90 seconds. However, right. we say that when an applicant is introducing themselves, you can go any time between three to five minutes. That's okay, but not more. So it's not supposed to be a monologue, um, which is why you need to be very specific uh, with the highlights that you want to talk about in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are five parts that I always recommend to talk about. So it's, first of all, your name and where you're from and where you're currently living. Then right. you dive into the topic of your work experience and your educational background. So you can go with your CV, basically. So start from the... Start from the very first experience that you've had, and then you get to the third part, which is basically your current status. So what are you doing now? What is your job now? What are your tasks, your responsibilities? And here you right. really want to stick with some highlights that are relevant to the role that you're applying for. Then there is a fourth part, which is optional, as I always say. It's kind of like a goodie, not a must-have. That's when you can talk about your hobbies. And that's very helpful for the interviewers to see who you are as a person. And this is actually very helpful if your hobbies are also aligned with your job role. You never know. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And then the, the fifth part is is the most important one. That's about your motivation for that particular position, for that company, why you are applying for that particular role right now. You could also talk about your aim, so your goal, where you want to go with that role. So maybe you already have a perspective of where you see yourself in five years and how this position can actually help you. And this okay. is what makes the difference. This will yeah, keep the interviewers uh, motivated as well to listen to you. And it also shows them that you have thought through why you are a perfect match for them. Okay. So shall we try that? Let's let's do because usually you do mock full mock interviews with your with your with your uh, uh, clients. So so we're not we're not going to do that today. But what what we can maybe do is uh, maybe I can give you a five point pitch. Yes. And we can and then you can you can say how uh, good or bad it was or what what, what maybe get some points from it. Uh, what what should we say that the job I'm applying for is because i'm a content i'm a content creator so shall we say it's a content creation job yes. at a company and you're the you're the uh you're the person interviewing me yes i'm okay, the hr so lady who's interviewing you for that particular position mm -hmm. okay i'm nervous i won't lie i'm a little nervous now <laughs> i believe you but that's okay <laughs> that's that's fine that's normal <laughs> Um, how, how would, how would they, how would they usually phrase it? Would they ask you, tell, tell us a bit about yourself? I guess that would be the most common way, right? Exactly. So after the last person has introduced themselves, so me, I would have said, hello, I'm the HR person at company XYZ for, um, the content. We are doing content creation basically. And yeah. now we would like to learn a little bit more about yourself. Can you tell us about okay. you? All right. So obviously, you know, my name is Sean. Uh, I am originally from South Africa, um, but I've been living in Germany for 14 years. And now I, I actually living in Nuremberg or, or near Nuremberg. Um, my, I have, uh, I started out my career in business analysis, but very soon realized that it wasn't for me. Um, I'm not a super analytical person. I don't do very well with numbers. So, and I'm I'm way more creative. So I always wanted to move to something more creative. So I ended up studying for a Bachelor of Arts in Communication Science. And then when I moved to Germany, I made a career switch to technical writing for a software company. And more recently, I've switched to content marketing, which is finally where I want to be. Um, uh, my current... A role that I'm in at the moment is content creation, so the creation of blogs, videos, uh, all kinds of content brochures, product brochures, uh, white papers, uh, everything that you can imagine. Um, and my my hobbies are actually also pretty much aligned with with uh, this kind of thing because I I host a podcast um, for foreigners in Germany called the German Experience, 
And I, um, I, I also play in a band. So I've got a lot of experience in my free time of also putting together content. So it's something that I love and I'm passionate about. And I went to, I've been looking for a, for, a, for a position that's interesting and challenging that I can bring my natural skills to. Wow, wonderful. Yay. <laughs> Great, Sean. How okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, first of all, you stuck with the time limit, which is perfect. You just highlighted everything from your career. I mean, you have a lot of experience. I know that <laughs> from also like working with you and having seen yeah. your, your profile on LinkedIn as well. So, um, you were really authentic and honest, which is something that recruiters and interviewers love because they already know your switch in your career from technical writing to content writing yeah. and so on. And from obviously being in the business world first and now more creative. So this is really, really helpful. And um, your hobbies are perfectly aligned with what you're doing. <laughs> so that's yeah. really, really good. That's very, very helpful. The, the motivational part obviously could be more elaborated, but this was yeah. totally fine yeah. now because we had this um, imaginary company. So we don't know what their mission and vision is, but this is something yeah. that you could uh, then elaborate if you know the company to um, yeah. talk about why they are the perfect fit. Yeah. I would also base it, I would also base it a bit on the, the job specification as well and try and fit that in there. Um, so it's, it, it's pretty specific. Like you said, know the company and uh, the job specification. So I guess that would be important. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that you can talk a little bit, uh, what kind of tasks are uh, so interesting to you that you want to get up in the morning. Something like that. Right. Yeah. So, but right. you've done that very well, Sean. Oh, thank <laughs> Perfect. You. So if this part <laughs> goes very well, then obviously the recruiters will ask some more questions. A very good hint whether you've done that very well uh, is from the time frame that you can see. So if the, if the interview ends after 20 minutes, that's not such a good time. Uh, <laughs> that's Not such a good, a good sign. sign yeah but right, if the right. if the interview lasts for 45 minutes an hour or even longer the longer it, yeah. it takes the better it is for you because that means that they are really interested in you because every person that is present costs money for the time right so they they are being paid for the time when they interview you and if they realize so this candidate is not the right fit then they would probably cut you off and then say thank yeah. you very much for coming in now you can leave but sean you've done this very well so we can go <laughs> on <laughs> with the next part of the interview which would then be from What they, what the interviewers have heard from what you've said in your pitch, they would dive into that and ask specific mm. questions along your CV. So okay. they normally have your CV at hand, what you have sent before then, and they will then ask you about specific times in your, in your, work life for example mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, there are some some questions that they could ask you for example when you said that you changed from business analyst to to um, technical writer yeah a, a very typical hr question would be why did you change from business analyst yeah. to to writing for example yeah so if, if my answer to that would be um Because I, I I realized that business analysis was not for me. It was I was not very happy there, and I realized it's because I was more of a big picture person, and business analysis requires a lot of nitty gritty details and analysis and figures and and so on. And that's just uh, it, it was just not something I'm suited to. I can do it. I, there is a le level of analysis that I can do, but just yeah, it was just way too detail oriented oriented. And I, as I said, I'm a creative person and I've always wanted to do something creative with my life. And that to me, I mean, you can be creative in business analysts, and, but for me, it wasn't the kind of creativity I was looking for. So I actively used the chance when I moved to Germany to, to move to something closer to what, I, what, what were my natural talents. And um, yeah, technical writing was a good fit because I was also, I'm also very good with English I got very good grammar and, and I'd had experience already working with software development. Yeah. 
Wonderful. That's a perfect answer. And that's also the amount on how much you can say when you're answering these questions. Okay. So, and okay. you were very specific giving examples and so on. So this is something that they look forward to. Um, yeah. So another question that I would ask um, with regards to specific questions along your CV is how would you describe the difference between technical writing and content writing? Uh so techni technical writing requires very precise, very um, accurate descriptions, as short as possible, no extra fluff, no every, you've got pretty much detail. It's documentation for software that, that users need to quickly understand. So it's got to be very, very uh, minimalist, very, uh, very comprehensive. Whereas with, obviously with content management, the kind of writing you're doing is more persuasive. It's got to be more entertaining, uh, which gives you a lot more chance to, to write about or to, to, you know, to be more, even more creative uh, with what you're writing. So I think that's the principal difference between technical writing and con uh, content marketing. Yeah, that makes, makes sense. Um, and very typical HR questions as well are always about your, psychological state of mind and they want to know um how you yeah well um how you experience change in your life so a, a very good question for any international who is working in germany or wants to work in germany would also be something like what 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 was your biggest challenge when moving to germany mm. Uh, learning German <laughs> was the biggest <laughs> challenge by far. It's the key to everything, but it's also the toughest thing to do. Um, but that would that would definitely be my my biggest challenge with that move. But it's something that I just focused on right from the beginning, and I was it was always definitely non negotiable that I would learn German. So I always focused on and made sure that I kept on going through it until I got to my level now, which is B two or B one, depending on which which language courses you believe. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's very good. That's already very good. But I can see that. I mean, German learning German. I'm always happy that I am German native so that I don't have to learn the language. <laughs> yeah, wonderful, Sean. So this is really, really great. That's normally the biggest part when it comes to a structured interview with these specific questions. Um, I, I can, mm -hmm. so, sorry to interrupt. I can also tell you something that I've had to deal with several times uh in this part of the discussion when it comes to specific questions because a lot of the questions will also come from the cv that you provided or from from your linkedin profile and so on and one of the things is gaps in my cv there's some there's some gaps in my cv like when i came to germany i was unemployed for six months um and i always try to uh have answers ready for those questions if they come and they've almost always uh, asked about those time periods there was a time where i was not working in south africa very briefly and then there was a time When I was, uh, as I said, when I got to Germany, it was six months where I was unemployed. So uh, that's another good thing to keep in mind. If there's anything that seems, I mean, it might not be, it can can be explained, but if there's anything that might s s raise questions on your CV, you should have uh, that in mind and be prepared to answer it in this phase. That's a very good advice because yeah. that's something that we, when we are screening the application documents, what we're looking forward to, because that is something, if we see a gap, oh yeah, wonderful. We can ask a question about the gap. <laughs> yeah, because it's going to be interesting, right? It's going to be interesting one way or another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, here, let's, let me just um, reassure you all. It's no big of deal that you have gaps in your CV. You're, we are all human. Everybody needs to figure out what we want to do at some point. You just need to show them what you have done in that time so that you were not the lazy couch potato, but maybe you have done some German course or you've, you've increased another skill or you were just simply applying for jobs, but nothing worked because you didn't know the market yet well enough. That's yeah. totally, yeah. totally acceptable. Perfect. Good okay. Advice. So, and another question that will come up uh, is always about uh, what you know about the company. So if you have talked about the vision of the company in your applicant's pitch already, then they might already be happy with that. But most of right. the time they will ask, what do you know about us? And then you can use all of the research that you have done beforehand, because obviously when you are applying and 
creating your job application documents, especially for the cover letter, for example, you make sure that you research the company a lot mm. because you mm. want to find out what does this company represent and do I really feel comfortable there? And that's what you want to bring across. Yes. So yeah. that's okay. a very typical question. Oh, yeah. Mm, another another part that is very possible are like specific tasks that you need to do so some sort of mini assessment center for you mm -hmm. as an individual if you don't have assessment centers in a group um, and for that you normally get some time when you can uh, prepare that particular task and go into a different room And you're preparing that. Maybe you get a flip chart and can prepare that. Or in the virtual world, they would um, still probably leave the camera on and watch you while you are preparing something. And then you can prepare a PowerPoint presentation or just some some sort of notes. And then you are presenting that task. And that is very technical. So that is very specific to whatever job you're applying for. That is not so much about the HR perspective, perspective, yeah. but about your technical side and your technical knowledge. Yeah. And then it's um, also possible that they, if they don't ask that specific task, they might ask a trick question so they are asking you something <laughs> where they try to get you out of your comfort zone so that's they okay. willingly do that to see how you react under stress they know mm -hmm. that you are nervous but they want to see how do you react when they are asking questions that you don't expect Sometimes they, those are estimate questions and they are really, really weird. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so for example, as, uh, let's go into the specific task that I could ask you, Sean, would be what okay. would you say is your biggest strength as a writer? Uh, biggest strength as a writer, um, my answer here would be because because let, let's say that the content creation is at a software company like like I work at now so then um, my answer would be uh, I think my biggest strength is that I'm able to take very very technical concepts and complex concepts and refine them and explain them very simply and produce blog posts from it or videos from it that's that's really uh, one of my uh, one of my strengths is that ability to because I've got the technical knowledge And then I can also convert that into language that's easily understandable for different levels of technical people. That's very, very helpful. And that's actually a very great um, yeah, managerial skill as well, because everybody's always asked to try to explain it to a four-year-old. And if you can <laughs> exactly. use really difficult concepts and explain them in easier words that everybody else can mm. understand, that's very valuable. So your your current yeah. company can be very happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who knows if I am able to do it? I'm just saying that I can do that. This is an interview <laughs> after all. <laughs> and then yeah. let's, let's uh, try to uh, use one of the trick questions. So this mm -hmm. could be very creative and um, here they could for example ask you if you were to appear on the cover of a magazine which magazine would you choose hmm, that's an interesting question <laughs> yeah uh Yeah, this is probably not the place where the time where you want to say on the Rolling Stones <laughs> music magazine as a rock star or something like that. <laughs> I, I, I guess, I guess I would say some kind of writer's magazine, like some kind of magazine for writers or, or something. Um, because I've always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a young kid. I wanted to be on radio and I wanted to be, a, or, or I wanted to be a writer. And I think if I was going to appear in a magazine, it would be like some kind of writer's Magazine. journal or something perfect yeah. i can hear your passion and um yes. <laughs> this there, there is like um yeah in german we call it a roter faden do you say in english red thread as well probably not <laughs> i think we do i think i don't know if it's just because it's something that i've learned in germ germany but but we we refer to the red thread in english in, in, in various companies that i've worked for but it could be a german germanized thing but yes the red thread the red thread is kind of the theme that runs through everything exactly and that's what i can see like being you always wanted to be a, a writer from very early on in your life and this is mm -hmm. the theme that yeah carries you through life and that is yeah yeah 
perfect that you can do that and that you can express that. And with yeah. regards to the magazine, so um, obviously you want to make sure that you are not using a very provocative magazine, for example. But <laughs> as long as you can explain what your thought is behind that, then everything mm. is fine. It doesn't really matter. And uh, sometimes you... you For this, there is no no right answer or no wrong answer. It's just yeah. that they want to see how you react and that you let them know your uh, thought process. So what are yeah. your thoughts with regards to that question? And just mm -hmm. yeah, show them how analytical you are or uh, show them why um, you would choose a writer's journal, for example. Yeah. In this in this phase, uh, one of the one of the things that you mentioned that you might get the, these physical tasks to do, and I just I just want to quickly give examples of tasks that I've faced in two of the two of the jobs that I applied for. The one was uh, when I was applying for a technical writer. Uh, they they asked me to prepare. They gave me twenty minutes to prepare, and and this was they didn't give me a laptop. I had to do it on paper with with a pen. So I had to write down. They said they asked me for a task. They said, "What task would you like to describe?" And I, I said, I, changing a car tire, for example. I think that's what I chose. And then they left me in the room for 20 minutes uh, with the pen and paper. And I had to write down step by step how you would change, just so they could see how I would describe it, the consistency that I would use. Uh, do I use the same formulations and so on? So that I, th I thought that was a really good test because it was quick. You did, I didn't need to understand anything about the company or what they do or their software, but it was really quick. So that's something you can expect. And when I was uh, going for my content uh, content uh, job, the, the one that I'm currently in, they asked me to do an actual blog post that to, before I came. So I had to prepare... I can't remember if it was before my first interview or between the first and the second interview, but I had to prepare a proper blog post. No, it was before because then I, we spoke about the blog post at the at the interview. Um, so that's also something that that could happen. We're just talking about your uh, what you were saying about actual tasks that they would give you. Exactly, and that's so interesting yeah. to hear because obviously they asked you to do that in your field of expertise and that's like very yeah. special for anyone for that particular role that you apply for. And normally yeah. they would tell you in advance that you can expect a little task or that you have to prepare right. some sort of homework like the blog post for example. Exactly. And that is yeah. really I mean <laughs> writing with pen and paper that is really interesting. I know. <laughs> I mean, who does that? Who does that? Come on. Exactly. But it's... Give me a laptop at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but that's really cool. Very, very okay. cool. Thanks for sharing that. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, this is this is perfect. Um, I would be very satisfied as a recruiter at this point. And then the recruiters get to the last uh, sec uh, section of the interview and they would ask you whether you have any questions. So it's always a very good idea for you to prepare some questions in advance so that you write that mm -hmm. down for yourself, that you know what you want to ask them. Sometimes all of these questions are already answered during the talk. That's fine. You can then um, also say, I had a lot of questions. For example, something like the onboarding process, but you've already right. mentioned that. You've already answered that. However, mm -hmm. if they haven't, Answer then. There are uh, some questions that I always highly recommend to ask. So that's, as I mentioned, the onboarding process. How does that look right. like? Because from that, you already see how they treat new employees and whether there mm -hmm. is some sort of mentorship or some sort of uh, development program and so on. So that you, mm -hmm. you know what to expect on your first day, for example. Then a very, um, Big question that is um, always recommended by the ent by all of my colleagues who are working <laughs> like me. It's always to ask how they define success for that particular position, because then the the line manager will elaborate on what they expect from you and then you get a feeling okay what is important to them is that the technical yeah. side or is that being present all the time um yeah. so it's about the line manager telling you what they actually expect because that's the person that is going to evaluate your performance that is um yeah basically then telling you whether you get um, a pay raise at some point or not so that's yeah. a very good question and 
obviously, you always want to know how the next steps look like in this application yeah. process. So when can you hear back from them? And it's always a good idea of you to ask them for their business cards at this point as well, so that you have the business cards of the people that you talk to. So when you are calling the company, for example, later on, that you make sure that you want to talk to the line manager, not the HR person, mm. not anyone else, right. in case the... Uh, maybe they say, if you have any questions, please contact this HR person that you know, then you contact that person. But if you have any mm. questions, always go for the line manager. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, because they are the ones that can push you through. The, if the line manager really yeah. wants to have you, they will push you through the process. Yeah, so okay. and you that's the that's the question that you want to ask. When can you expect an answer? And I guess this, this uh, phase of the interview is when you would ask any specific questions to your to your uh, conditions that you'd be interested in, I think. because But the question is, how, how far should you go? Yeah. So for example, if I'm interested in working from home three days a week, is this something like you could maybe ask them in this part, what are your uh, viewpoints about home office or remote work? Is that something you support? And then you can also get a feel. Because I always say that the, an, an interview is also you interviewing the company. You, you want to make sure that the company is right for you too. And I think I guess this would be the point where you would ask those kinds of questions. But you also don't want to go too far, I guess, and um, seem like you've got too many problems or baggage that you're bringing with. I don't know. It's about finding a balance, I, I would assume. Yes, exactly. So um, that's a very good question. You can always ask that uh, in this this part. So especially mm. with a pandemic, it's really, help, uh, really great that uh, um, interviewers are open to that. So you could, for example, ask, how did your company work with the pandemic? Did you offer home office? And how did that look like, for example? Or you could ask, right. would it be possible to work from home for a couple of days? Uh, that's totally fine. With regards to the salary negotiation, that would happen here if you don't know how much money you would earn. Sometimes they yeah. would say, well, we have a specific contract and it's all set. So something um, like work, um, when you're paid according to tariff, yeah? So it's yeah. like Tarifvertrag, yeah. then there's nothing that, uh, not a lot of um, salary negotiation going on apart yeah. from, okay, I want to jump one of the salary levels, for example. That's mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. here as well. But yes, just make sure that they are really interested in you and everything else can come on later as well. If they're yeah. really interested yeah. in you, they will make sure that you get all of the all of the things that you need to be happy in your job as well. Yeah. And when, when it comes to salary, uh, they might ask you what you're expecting to get as a salary at some point during this this interview when when would that question come up and how 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 is it the best way to handle that because a lot of foreigners don't even know what salary they they should be hoping for especially if it's their first job in germany exactly and that's a very difficult question also to answer because this always depends on the area the region the city where you're working in and um obviously the the industry that you're working in so whether that is in pharma industry which is very big or the automotive industry yeah. or in the food industry for example then um I always recommend uh, different websites. So there's one that's called Glassdoor. You might have heard of that. And another one is Kununu, where you can actually mm -hmm. enter a lot of your personal information with regards to how many years of experience do you have? Where do you want to go? Yeah. So which city and what's the industry that you're applying for? And you get already hints for the job interview sometimes and also the salary bands. And that okay. is something that you could um, use for your for, for the salary negotiation when it comes to that. And it is very typical that the salary negotiation happens at the end of the interview. So it happens okay. uh, when you're done with the specific questions. And yeah, and yeah. Um, if you don't ask for the money, they sometimes say, well, we would have expected you to ask about the money. So... Okay. That happens as yeah. well. So yeah. the yeah. salary negotiation is normally at the end of the specific questions. Right. Yeah. So so that's th this is also the phase of the interview where you could then float that yourself. If it hasn't come up yet, you could say, "What are we looking at with regards salary? How does um, what do you expect? What are your expectations, and so on?" Yeah. Okay. And that's the interview, folks. Obviously, like I said at the beginning, it's going to differ depending on the company, depending on the role. Um, but this is the basis of what 
what you can expect. And generally, that's that. You say goodbye, and then if they liked you, you'll get a call within a few days, and then you'll get a, you get an invitation to a second interview. Um, and a second interview is generally more of a formality for them to just have a final look at you and for maybe a, a senior manager to to come in and ask you a few questions. Um, but yeah, the, the, the main, the main, the, the main, generally the hardest interview for me is the, the first interview. Yeah, that's in, true. In the past. Yeah. And yeah. you can normally say, um, sometimes they also, uh, offer you a quick walk around and show you your, your workplace. So if they do that, yeah. you already know they are very interested in you. <laughs> yeah. That's a good sign. That's a very good <laughs> it's sign. It's a very good yeah. sign. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But as you said, sometimes there are several interviews and I would also say that the first one is the most, it's the hardest because, um, yeah. that's when you do all of the research. And then the second one, you already know, okay, what did they ask me? Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I, I'm prepared yeah. for that yeah. now. All right, Lisa, as usual, so many insights, so many uh, uh, ideas and tips and everything. It's very, very uh, helpful talking to you. And I think people will find it very helpful. Where can people find you if they want to uh, talk to you, ask you questions, um, get your expertise? Yeah. So the perfect way of contacting me is always through my website, lisajans.com. Or you can also find me on YouTube or Instagram, for example, and you can just simply chat there. LinkedIn, obviously, I'm there as well. And um, you can always book a free consultation with me just in case you want you, you want to make sure, is Lisa really the person that can help me or not? So um, that is something that I, that I offer. And when it comes to specific mock job interviews, for example, I normally talk to my coaches beforehand and ask them what is your industry what is your task and so on because then i can obviously also ask these tech technical questions yeah that right. is sometimes really interesting because i'm the hr lady i don't <laughs> so and then <laughs> learning more about the technical side of things is really cool right <laughs> nice bonus of the job yeah Okay. Well, excellent. So people get in touch. All the links are in the show notes. You can find uh, Lisa there. And thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me again, Sean. It was a great pleasure. And from my point of view, you would have um, made it to the next round, at least. If not, yes. uh, you would have gotten the job. So <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. 